Okay, welcome, welcome snow kiters. My name is Adrenogen and I am here today to talk to you about the pros and cons of using inflatable kites on snow for snow kiting. This is a subject I'm super passionate about and I can't wait to share some information with you, which hopefully you'll put into action out there in the field. I've got some tips today on safety, on launching and landing, on how to deal with your inflatable kites in cold weather. So let's get started. Okay, so please use the chat in this meeting if you would like to um, ask any questions. Please tell me where you're coming from today. Or, and if you're new to snow kiting, or you're already an intermediate or advanced snow kiter. Hopefully there's lots of kite surfers and kiteboarders here today um, who already have inflatable kites and maybe you guys are keen skiers um, or snowboarders and maybe you've put the two together yet, maybe you haven't, but I've got some great information here which will help with the transition from water to snow. So let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Jenny Milton, AKA Adrenogen. I've been into adrenaline sports all my night life and the nickname Adrenaline Jenny or Adrenogen just stuck. I'm a professional snow kiter and snow kite coach. Um, I'm a professional kite surfer. I love kite surfing in the waves and instructor. And I have both the IKO certification and KA, which stands for Kiteboarding Australia. I'm also a big mountain skier and a back country guide. I've been skiing since I was two years old. So uh, skiing runs in my blood. My brother Michael Milton is a, a famous ski racer from Australia and holds the uh, world speed skiing record for a person with a disability. Um, so I've been skiing all my life. My mum and dad were also into sailing. Uh, they owned a ski shop and in the wintertime they would sell ski gear and in the summertime uh, they would sell windsurfers and other sporting equipment. So I've been so blessed and lucky to have had such a great upbringing that has introduced me to all these amazing sports. Over the years, I've achieved a few awards, which I'm very proud about. I'm proud to have been the Australian Women's Kite Surfing Champion in 2018 in the waves. That also got me a um, wildcard entry into the GKA that year, and I got fourth place and the Rookie Award, although I was the oldest person in, in the contest. Um, one other thing I'm super proud of is I got to compete in the Red Bull Ragnarok snow kite race in 2019 and was proud to come second in the women's ski uh, section, which was amazing. And also I got the chance this year to also race snow kiting at the Alaska Snow Kite Festival and uh, came first place in a few of the heats and also in the final um, against some incredible other kiters. So let's get into snow kiting, right? Now, snow kiting, there's three different skills that we need to learn. We need to learn ski and snowboard skills, which you can learn inside a ski resort to get to an intermediate or an advanced level of skiing or snowboarding. Then we need to learn our kite skills. We need to get some kite lessons on water um, or on snow and build your skills and kite confidence, build your confidence out there kiting in the mountains. Um, now there's a lot of water kiters who have some really great kite skills. They're also pretty good in the resorts with their ski and snowboard skills, but maybe they haven't learned any backcountry skills yet. So it's important to start adding those skills into your toolkit so I recommend going on a backcountry basics tour, doing a wilderness first aid course, do an avalanche awareness course, so your AVI one even better. So we can learn all those skills separately and then we can put them together. Um, please let me know in the chat if you are a kiteboarder on water or only kiting on snow. So what is an inflatable kite? Great question. We have two sorts of kites which we're mainly using in the kite boarding and the snow kite world. One is a foil kite, like the yellow ozone chrono that I've got on the, the ground there, which I raced the Ragnarok on. 
And then also the LEI or inflatable leading edge kites like the green Rio in the picture. Now, according to Wikipedia, just to make it simple, a leading edge inflatable kite or LEI as they call it, is a single skin kite with inflatable bladders providing structure. An LEI is a great kite for water because the inflated bladders cause it to float on the water surface so that it can sit on the water for an indefinite time and still be water relaunched. Because unlike a foil, there are no chambers that can fill with water, it floats. Those LEI kites are generally used for kite surfing and snowboarding, but they are also great for snow kiting. I get asked three main questions um, when I'm talking about using inflatables on snow. And the first question I always get asked are, are inflatables safe to use on snow kiting? Shouldn't I just be using a foil kite? Well, my experience and my answer to that question is yes, they are safe to use for snow kiting. I've been using inflatables on snow for 14 years now and I've never destroyed a kite and I've been safe. Plus all of the people that I take on snow kiting adventures, a high percentage of them use inflatables and they've been working really well. Now, the other question that you're going to get asked, I get asked a lot, is should I use the same size kite as I do on the water? Well, that all depends. So let's talk about the variables. So the variables are we need to be aware of the kite as standards. If you're a beginner and you're just starting out, you might want to use a smaller kite. But as you improve, you can handle more power and you can handle a bigger kite. The other variable is the snow surface, right? So you can have uh, icy, firm conditions, which we don't have a lot of friction on. And so we may not want to use too big a kite if the snow conditions are firm um, because we don't want to go too fast and it can be hard to, to slow down on a hard, icy surface. The other variable is altitude. So depending on where you're kiting at, whether you're kiting in Australia, which is where I am right now, or whether you're kiting in Alaska or let's just say Colorado, high altitude snow kiting there. So if you're at high altitude, the air is thinner and you're gonna need a bigger kite, right? Whereas if you're closer to sea level, then you might be closer to the same size that we would use on water. The other variable in terms of choosing your size is what sort of style of kiting are you trying to, to do or achieving? And what's your objective of your session? Are you going out there and trying to, to boost and jump, right? And we can use a freestyle kite for that. You might want to use slightly bigger. Or are you going on a, a long distance downwinder and the, very, the wind might change in different areas, um, especially if you're going uphill. We have something called a wind gradient, which means that as you go up in altitude, the wind tends to be stronger as you go up. So at the top of the mountain, you might need a six meter kite, but at the bottom of the mountain, you might be on a 12. So there's a lot of variables in terms of choosing your kite size. It's not just as simple as we use smaller kites on snow. If I use a small kite on snow, I'm not gonna have enough power to get up to the top of the mountain where I wanna go, right? Now, the other question which I get asked quite a lot is, will I damage my inflatable kite on snow? We all spend, a decent amount of money on our kites and we want to look after them, right? So I've had people say, oh, I don't want to use my inflatables on snow because they'll get damaged. No, not if you make smart decisions. As I mentioned, I've been kiting, using inflatables on snow for a long time and I've never, never destroyed a kite, nor have I seen somebody destroy a kite um, when they've been snow kiting with me. Apart from, oh, I remember one person that got their kite wrapped around a, uh, a road sign and another one who put it in a tree. So if we make smart decisions and we avoid rocks, trees, power lines, that's going to, that's going to prevent us from damaging the kite. If it just crashes on the snow, chances are it's going to be fine. But there's something we can do to, to help look after our kites, and that is to keep the struts open. On water, we seal the struts in, in order to have, you know, a flotation device if something goes wrong. But on snow, we want to keep those struts open so that if we crash it onto a hard surface, the air can distribute through the struts in order to prevent something blowing out. And that works very efficiently. 
The other thing in order to not damage your kite is we need to anchor our kite securely. Okay, and I'm going to get more into anchors in just a second. So anchoring is a way of holding our kite in one position. Um, on water, most of the time, we're setting them up on the beach and we might put sand on top or a backpack or we might lead our board against it, something so it doesn't blow away. Now, on certain snow surfaces, they can be super slippery and one breath of wind, our kite wants to move. So it's super important that we choose an anchor um, that's suitable for the snow surface. Now, the anchor that I love to use most of the time is an avi shovel. We should already have it in our backpack for safety. So we may as well use it. We can use that avi shovel to shovel snow on top of our kite. We can also use it to uh, create an anchor on the bridle. We can use a fixed object like a snow machine or uh, a fence post. Oh, by the way, they call them snowmobiles everywhere except Alaska. In Alaska, when we're up there, they're called snow machines. So it just rattles off my tongue after spending so much time out there. We can use a heavy backpack, you know, if it's powder snow, which is the most epic sessions of all, um, we, the avi shovel isn't going to work. We may not have a fixed object around. So having a backpack, putting some of our gear in it, um, you know, loading it up with some snow, anything we can do, put that backpack on top. Um, if you are snow kiting on a frozen lake, hopefully there's a little bit of fresh snow on top, that, which makes it fun. But again, you're not going to be able to get an avi shovel through the ice. So you might want to bring an ice screw like in the picture there. There's also another method which I use quite often called a snow anchor, a V method. And I'm going to show you what that is in just a few minutes. The other thing that we can use for skis and um, for anchoring is our skis and our snowboard. Now, I've seen people lean their snowboard, their ski up against the kite, like we do our kite boards, but people forget that they've actually got sharp metal edges. And if they don't, they should. You're going to be able to go upwind better if you've got your edges sharpened and a good wax on there. So I don't recommend leaning your skis and snowboard on your kite. I had a, a client um, who came up to Alaska this year and he told me, oh, Jenny, I don't know about the shovel idea. I think I'll just continue using my skis. And uh, about a month later, I got this message, Jen, oh, I damaged my kite with putting my skis on. I should have listened to you. So, you know, think about it. We can use our skis and snowboard as an anchor if we actually bury them in the snow and wrap a leash around it. That's um, one of the things we get taught when we're doing crevasse rescue is how to use our skis and snowboard as a really secure anchor in order to pull people out of holes. So we can use that method, but I don't recommend leaning them on your kite. So anchoring for high winds, right? Um, now, I love to kite in high winds and I'll go out in 30 knots plus, right? Like the picture down the bottom there. So an avi shovel is the number one method if you've got the right snow surface, right? Um, and it tends to work really well in high winds because the powder's normally being wind affected by now. It gets more compressed by the wind and we get that firm, firm sort of snow that we can get um, a shovel in there. But I also recommend making sure you've got more than one method of anchoring. So having a double anchor, like shoveling snow on your kite, like putting the shovel in there, using a V method and snow on your kite. Um, having multiple anchoring is a great idea. I couldn't tell you how many times I've had to skate as fast as I can trying to chase somebody's kite that they haven't anchored properly. So the snow anchor V method, let me tell you about this one. Um, this method works really well in that firm, dense snow that I was talking about, which we do get a lot of the time. When it's windy, the snow does get compacted, like I mentioned. Um, so what we do is we use our skis or our snowboard boots to shuffle, shuffle our feet to create a V shape in the snow, like in the picture. The second step is to use... Um, Oh, I made a little mistake on my slide there. The second thing that we do is we use the bridle of the kite to pull over the V 
And then we also, we need to double check to make sure that it's holding. Now this method works really well um, in a lot of different snow conditions and I recommend it as, as an option if that is gonna work for you. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about in with inflatable kites for snow kiting is having multiple launching and landing options, right? We get taught a, quite a few methods when we're learning to kite on water, but there's a few extra ones I'd love to share with you um, that are great safe ways of launching and landings at different locations. Those methods are, so for launching, We've got an assisted launch, which hopefully most of you know if you already own an inflatable kite. We've got self-launching. Now, this is something that I teach very early on in the snow kite progression, because if you crash your kite away from the group, there may be nobody there to help you. So knowing how to self-launch is key. And I've got some fantastic methods um, for teaching people how to self-launch that are super safe. There's also something called a reverse launch. Have you heard of that? That's going to be that's going to be a method that we use in light wind if our inflatable kite has landed leading edge down. We can actually pull the two outside lines to get the kite to fly up in reverse, drop one line and it spins around and off we go. There's also something called a hot launch. And we use a hot launch in lighter winds. And sometimes after we do a reverse launch, if it flips over, and it's trailing edge down with the leading edge up, we can do a hot launch, which is where we pull our middle lines and off it goes. Hot launches can be dangerous if we're just on the beach, right, on our feet. But if we've got skis or snowboard on, if you point it towards the kite, when we do a hot launch, all of a sudden we get towed towards it and the power is, is reduced. An anchored launch. So using, using it, we call it a dead man, having a piece of rope and a carabiner and anchoring that to a fence post or your snow machine, if you've got that option. There's also a way of launching if you're on slope. What if you're on a, a steep slope? How do, we, how do we launch? Sometimes the wind and slope angle aren't the same. And uh, there's some great tips for skiing or snowboarding backwards in order to create motion to get the kite to lift off. Snowboarders also have lots of options um, when they're launching um, for either having the board on or off before or after launch. And that is going to be depending on the, the wind speed as well. Now, there's also lots of landing options, assisted landing, self-landing, a safety land. That's my favorite. That's, the I believe, the safest way to land. And that's by pulling your chicken loop and the kite is going to slide down that safety line and land. A lot of people say to me, oh, but Jen, isn't it going to be in a huge mess? And now I've got to now I've got to spend half an hour untangling my lines. No. That can happen if you do a, a pull your chicken loop in an emergency or out in the water. But if you do it intentionally and you've planned on it, so you set up your safety line correctly, the kite will just land perfectly. And I've had many students. Uh, challenged me on this one and I think my I, I did it in 16 seconds got it back back in place after pulling my uh, safety and getting it back ready to launch having an anchored land the same way as I mentioned with the anchored launch we can land the same way wind hole landing if you can find an area where there's uh, some terrain upwind of you and it's created a hole downwind of it that's a great place to bring your kite down in that wind hole to land. And then there's also methods for landing on slope. Maybe you've snow kited up the mountain to the top and you've decided you just want to ride down rather than keeping the kite in the air. And there's methods for landing the kite on slope as well. So this talk is about the pros and cons of using inflatable kites. And although I love using them, there are some cons. One, they're heavy to carry, right? So uh, the, the foils tend to be small and light and fit in your backpack. That's definitely a pro of a foil. Um, they're big to fit in your backpack. They definitely don't fall, um, fold up as small as a foil kite. So if you're wanting to take two kites, which I always recommend taking two kites into the field rather than trying to guess what you need before you get there, um, you might have a big backpack like you can see me carrying in the photo. 
We also need to carry a pump. So that's one extra thing to put in our, our pack. Um, they're heavy in light winds. Yeah, let's just say it's five, five knots out there. A foil is going to be a better option because they don't weigh as much in the sky. Even with a, a 15 or an 18 meter inflatable, they're heavy. They need some wind in order to keep them flying. Also dealing with plastic parts in cold conditions is definitely a con, but I've got some good tips for you there um, in order to, to have a good system to make sure no damage is done in cold conditions. And I've been out in oh, minus 30 plus um, and had no problems using my inflatable kites. The other con is maybe your upwind angle for racing. When I had the choice of choosing my inflatable or the foil kite for the Ragnarok, I know that those high aspect foils are going to allow me to point up wind a lot better. What are the pros? The pros of using inflatable kites for snow kiting? Well, there's quite a few. Kiteboarders already own them. If you've already got a quiver of kites, that's awesome. You can now use them all year round, both on snow and in the water. You're gonna get your money's worth out of them then. You can have one quiver for both the water and snow. They're easy to launch and land and there's multiple options. You've also got the ability to rest, take photos, pee on dead man position. <laughs> I have a friend who, who did that before a race. And what I mean on dead man position is actually uh, leaving it at the edge of the window and you're able to let go of the bar and the kite will just sit and bounce there. There's less lines and bridles to deal with which is definitely a pro, um, especially when we might have a snow surface that has sastrugi or, you know, a rough surface that the, the lines or the bridles might catch on, right? Um, so I, I love having less lines to deal with. They're very smooth in gusty conditions, the inflatables. Um, they hold their shape. So when we get a lull in the wind and then we get a gust, they don't tend to yank you. They're very smooth in those gusty conditions that we get in the mountains sometimes. The other pro is the ability to tune them for different styles. I know my ozone rios have some fantastic settings to be able to, you know, switch them from uh, a light bar pressure to a heavier bar pressure so that you can use them, make them better for jumping. You might make them better for drifting. We can change the... Uh, the position that it sits at, at the edge of the window, depending if we've got onshore or side off conditions in the waves, which relate to the mountains exactly the same. We wanna have the right wind angle to slope angle, and we can tune our kites to deal with that, which is fantastic. I love using my, my wave kites because they have the feature of being able to drift down the mountain. So just like in the photo here, I can use it to tow me up. And then if I want to get ski turns, beautiful ski turns coming down, I can just park it at 45 and let it drift down quite low, really low in front of you so that I can, I can ski at a faster speed. We're limited by our speed when we're skiing down a mountain by the speed that the kite will drift. Um, and you can choose a whole heap of different styles of inflatable kites. We've got freestyle kites for jumping, the waves kites, as I mentioned, there's all round kites, kites for when you're just learning, which is super friendly. So we've got a huge variety of kites to choose from. Now I'm gonna give you a few tips for using inflatable kites on snow. Choose your kite size based on the standard of kite you are and the conditions and the altitude that you've got. Keep your strut valves open in order to not damage it if it does crash hard on a firm surface. Be careful of the plastic parts during setup and pack down, right? Especially in the older style kites, um, which had the male and female valve. I used to have to stick that in my mouth in order to sort of warm it up a little bit before I stuck the, um, the pump attachment in there. While we're talking about pumps, bring a small light pump. I was able to buy a, a Coleman pump designed for, you know, pumping up a, a, uh, an inflatable mattress for camping. And that thing is small. 
yeah, it might take me longer to pump up, but it's not as heavy to carry rather than bringing our huge pumps that we're, we're all using at the beach now. Um, a lot of people have ha had a problem, including myself, where you stick the pump valve in and it just keeps coming out because the plastic is cold. So my little trick for that is to huff and puff, stick it in your mouth if it's yours, and that will help, that condensation, condensation will help to keep it in there while you pump up your kite. Carry some duct tape, duct tape to repair. Pump hoses is the things that I've probably broken the most out there. Um, so having some duct tape that you wrap around your pump hose on one end means that you've got it ready there. If suddenly it cracks when you're out there, it'll stop a lot of swearing. You can just repair it very quickly and easily. Now be prepared with anchors. Like I've mentioned, there's lots of different sorts of anchors. So think about the location that you're going to beforehand so that you're prepared with the anchors that you'll need. Carry an extra leash. I always have an extra leash that's attached to the back of my harness. And that's something I can wrap around my skis if I need to, or a post if I need to, in order to have an anchored landing or launch. Um, and it's good to have, you know, maybe a rope with a carabiner as well. They tend to, we, then we can, you know, choose the length that we want for our dead man solution. Understand your launching and landing options. There's lots of them and it's really great um, to learn all of those options. So no matter what windy conditions you have or wherever you end up, you know there's a method of you launching, getting back to base and then landing safely. Stay away from rocks, trees, power lines, etc. I mean, that's just common sense. But when we're on the mountain, there are rocks around and you might see other kiters weaving between them. One of them is probably me. But I'm at that stage where I'm not crashing my kite. If you're still at the stage where you're crashing your kite, stay well away from all anything that could hurt you or your kite. I have a no crash policy. That's what I call it. If I'm in a situation where there might be a few red flags or dangers around, I'm flying that kite so that I don't crash it. I'm not going to be making, you know, new maneuvers that I'm not not used to or maybe trying an extra you jump if there are some of those dangers around and carry a repair kit you know maybe you might not have it in your backpack unless you're going for a few day mission but have it in the car so if you do damage your kite you can repair the fabric or the bladder uh down loop down looping is a great skill. Um, it's an advanced skill that we learn on, on water, but it's actually a skill that we need to learn quite quickly in our snow kiting journey because a down loop can create extra power for going up steep mountains and also for going downwind. I'll tell you a little story here. This is a good one. I had, uh, I had a gentleman come up to Alaska on a kite camp with me and he'd been kiting for 15 years on water. He's a big wave surfer and, and kiter. And he had some serious kite skills. And so when I said, okay, we're going to down loop to, uh, to go up the mountain, I could see some hesitation in his face. I said, you know, do you down loop when you're out kite surfing? Oh, occasionally, he said. I said, okay, well, let's, let's have a practice on the snow. Let's try to, so oh, no, it's too dangerous to do on the snow. I'm going to get slammed. But once I was able to show him how it's so much easier in snow because we can just point our skis or snowboard towards the kite when we down loop and it takes all of that extra power out of it because we're not an anchor anymore, right? And he was stoked. He became the down looping king. He was down looping and down looping up the mountain and having a great time. Now that evening when he got back to the hotel, he sent a, a, a message to uh, Patrick Reebstock who is an incredible kite surfer in our industry. If you don't know him, Google Patrick Reebstock. Sent Patrick a message because he kites with him all the time. Told him about his day. I was down looping up the mountain. It was just fantastic. And uh, what he told me, the message that Patrick sent back was, what, you had to go all the way to Alaska to learn how to down loop from a girl? <laughs> I love it. But what a great skill that is. Now, also, another tip is consider using a snow kite harness. I use an ozone-specific snow kiting harness, which is very similar to a climbing harness. 
You can use climbing harnesses, although the snow kite harnesses do offer much better back support. So if you've got any back issues like myself, I'm not gonna wanna use a climbing harness with a carabiner on the top. I'm gonna use a snow kite harness. And when we are using those um, climbing harnesses or snow kite harnesses, we don't necessarily need a hook, right? We can just release our chicken loop, thread it through the carabiner or our snow kite harness and reconnect it. This is a great way to attach it to your harness. And it also gives you that extra check of making sure that your safety is working, right? So I hope you've learned some great tips uh, about using inflatable kites on snow, right? Um, I'd love to hear from you if you've enjoyed this talk or you've got more questions that I maybe haven't answered, please send me an email, send me a message on Instagram or Facebook and have a, have a look at my, my website. So I hope you've really enjoyed the talk today um, and I, I hope you'll follow me on Instagram for more tips and tricks or keep an eye on your inbox in your email if you've subscribed in order to know when the next talk is. And also consider coming and joining me on a snow kite trip. I've got one coming up next week in Australia at Charlotte's Pass, which is with the Kite Thrills crew from up in Queensland. Um, that trip includes coaching, guiding. We're going to do snow kite avalanche courses. We're going to cover in more detail everything here that I've mentioned. Plus, we've got accommodation, food, parties, everything's included. So contact me if you'd like to go to Charlotte's Pass snow kiting next week. Otherwise, think about joining me in Idaho for a kite camp or a private lesson. And the ultimate, my favorite, come to Alaska snow kiting. It is the ultimate. You might think in this photo, maybe it's looking a little advanced, but we have frozen lakes. We have these benches, which is where I teach people to down loop and the skills that we need to go up the mountain. So I would love to see you in Alaska, Montana, Idaho, or Australia. So thanks very much for joining me. And I look forward to talking with you more about snow kiting in the future. Thanks so much. See you next time.